I choked while serving in the United States Navy and was chewing on a hard-boiled egg. I could only inhale. My lungs filled up until they couldn't take any more. I had the impression that if I could get the egg out of my mouth, I would be able to live. I strolled up to a neighboring water fountain and turned on the water. When I tried to drink, I was shocked with 120 volts as the water reached my lips. My first realization was that I'd been subjected to an electrical shock, which I fully expected to survive. I was still having trouble breathing because of the egg caught on my esophagus. I wiped part of the egg away with my finger, but I couldn't breathe. By this point, I was in a state of fear and couldn't think of any method to help myself escape this accident. I remembered my Lord and thought to myself, at least I'm a Christian. When I looked into the adjacent room, I noticed my boss sitting in a swivel chair, working on a radio message. Recognizing that I could still walk, I did so until I arrived at his chair. I couldn't speak, so I used the last of my strength to kick his chair to grab his attention. He was thrown to the floor, where he died alongside the typewriter. I'm on the floor next to my boss because I fell as well. Joe, another sailor, was keeping an eye on my movements. I was now deafeningly quiet and not breathing. I was bleeding from the bridge of my nose after collapsing and hitting the desk. Joe quickly began using back pressure life-saving techniques to me. This is now known as CPR. An ambulance was summoned by another sailor. I was near the room's ceiling, watching the sailors do everything to save my life. I was in good spirits. I realized the unconscious person on the floor belonged to me, but I was unconcerned about it. I was seeing myself through the eyes of others. This time, there was no opposite reflection when I looked in the mirror. I was feeling terrific and energetic and I quickly lost interest in seeing the sailors work with my body. I was in spirit form, but I felt just as alive as I had before. I believe I expected to die, but everything was so fresh to me. I was adjusting to my new life quickly and without any care for anything. However, this new way of life has left me perplexed. For example, when I had an idea, I did it automatically. I stared at the nearby wall and the next thing I knew, I was walking through it. When I choked, I was back in the room where I had been seated. I could float around this room at will. I breezed through several radios and teletype machines. I noticed a gloomy spot near my desk and went there. I was in this gloomy cloud next thing I knew. I was desperate to get out once I was inside. I was being engulfed by this beast. The sensation was similar to being inside a human. I was concerned and missed my free-floating spirit from before. I was eventually freed from the suffocating and scorching environment. It seemed like I was inside a womb. But how can it be imagined? The next thing I realized was that I was in a tunnel. This tunnel's diameter is estimated to be six to seven feet. I was able to stand without touching the top. My height was five feet, 10 inches. I was hurling through the tunnel more faster than I had planned. The speed was incredible. I was terrified. I came to a halt somewhere along my trek in this tunnel and a man calmed me down and told me the adventure was coming to a conclusion. I took off again at the same pace as before. I'm not sure how I made it through the trip. The speed had to be at or near the speed of light. I felt no g-forces, only the anxiety and exhilaration of traveling at such a high speed. Finally, I came to a halt in the tunnel and had a good look at it. The tunnel resembled a huge vent pipe found in laundry dryers. The light was coming in from the outside, not from inside the tube. I was inside the tunnel when I heard a loud buzzing sound that damaged my ears. I was curious as to what held the tunnel together. I started walking now, looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. I was in a much broader region now, surrounded by white mist and daylight. 
My anxieties of the tunnel were allayed by the light I was seeing. I heard people's voices just outside this place. The voices urged me to pass through the white mist. I noticed around a dozen people as I walked through the white mist. I'd seen these people before, but I couldn't recall their names. One fellow advised me not to be concerned about my inability to recall names. Someone soon arrived to get me. He was about 27 years old and dressed in Levi's and a white t-shirt. The other 12 were dressed in white robes. The man in Levi's stated that he was my tour leader. He said I would meet other people later, but he wanted me to walk with him to see this new place first. We strolled through the most stunning flower beds I'd ever seen. The petals of the flowers were scrutinized in great detail by me. When I was looking at grass lawns, I concentrated on single blades of grass and was amazed at the beauty of each one. As I had done with a group of 12 people, I communicated with this man through thought transference. I noticed a metropolis with tall skyscrapers in the distance. The structures were the hue of gold, according to my guide. My advisor informed me that if I wished to be closer to the city, I could. Sure enough, I thought about getting closer, and before I knew it, I was on the outskirts of the Golden Metropolis. I observed some extremely breathtaking waterfalls in the flower gardens. I felt fantastic. Later, my guide handed me over to another man, who told me that I would now go through my life's evaluation. During this evaluation, which lasted about a second or less, I observed all I had seen earlier while living on Earth. I replayed every discussion I'd ever had. I saw every pet I'd ever had. I saw every article of clothing I'd ever worn. I relived every class I'd ever taken in school. I saw everything, all over again. My life's review came to a close in this edifice, which resembled a library. It was also there that I discovered I would not be remaining in this lovely land. I was devastated to learn that I would have to return to Earth. I sobbed and cursed at the people around me. My guide arrived and escorted me to see two classmates who had died four years before. I was surprised to see them alive. They had been football placers in high school. They were late for football practice one day, and their coach made them run laps around the field afterward. As a result, they were in the locker room long after the other players had left. Showers were impossible to take because there was no hot water. The two were gassed to death by fumes emitted by the natural gas water heater as they sat waiting for the water heater to provide hot water for their showers. Ironically, one of the boy's fathers was the plumber who had just installed the heater a few days before and was returning the next day to install the vent pipe to the exterior of this new shower room. I questioned the two boys why they were here, considering they were both meant to be dead. They told me that no one ever dies. The two boys were roughly the same age as when I last saw them on Earth. Both appeared to be satisfied and happy to be here. My guide returned me to the location of my life review. I asked again if I could stay. A man told me that I needed to return to Earth to finish my life. I knew from Sunday school that if someone wanted to see the Lord, he would appear. I requested to see Jesus. I walked, or floated to a little stage with my guide by my side. My guide dropped me off there. I didn't have to wait long until I heard a voice on this platform, close to where I was standing. When I heard a voice asking if I could see him, a mist began developing on the stage. The only thing I could see was the mist and heard the voice. The voice told me that if I concentrated harder, I would be able to see him. Soon after, I noticed Jesus standing in front of me. He inquired as to what I expected from him. I informed him that I'd discovered I'd have to return to Earth and that I didn't want to leave this lovely world. He explained to me that I had not yet fulfilled his wishes for me during my existence. I asked him what some of his wishes were, but he didn't respond. 
He stated I'd find out when the time was right, someday in the future. He inquired about additional things he might do for me. Because I was in the U.S. Navy at the time, I requested that he transfer me to the state of Tennessee. I told him that I'd spent a month in the state as a 12-year-old lad and that I wanted to return because the state was wonderful. He didn't respond. I inquired if he'd given it any thought. He told me that I only needed to ask once and everything would be taken care of. Many things were foretold to me by Jesus during my lifetime. I just remembered what he said to me after the occurrence. He did tell me, and I remembered this, that I should tell everyone about my meeting with him. He suggested that I inform everyone that he is real. Another thing I'll never forget is feeling his love radiate from him when he stood close to me. That he was the most wonderful love I had ever experienced. Jesus promised me that I would be taken back to my earthly home soon. Two men approached me and said that they were my guardian angels. One of the men had previously served as my tour guide. I don't recall returning to earth via the tube. We journeyed across space's blackness. We came to a halt on our journey back to earth to chat. One of my guardian angels told me that one day I would meet a lady who would become a dear friend of mine. I was told that I wouldn't be able to meet her right away because she was still a little girl. It was 1957. I've been looking for her ever since and I believe I've located her. However, she lives in Australia. I awoke in the hospital, sitting on an examination table. I inquired of the three doctors whether I had been given any drug that would make me believe I had died and gone to heaven. They declined. Well, I just returned from heaven, I explained. Two physicians left right away, and the remaining third doctor said he didn't know what to think. <laughs>